This transmission is about the five things that I would like to see at the front of players' minds as they approach Star Trek Adventures for the first time. Of course, everyone has a different approach to this game and different tastes, but if you were to be arriving at my table, based on my experience of the sorts of things that are overlooked or that folks are perhaps slower to discover and yet are great joys and strengths of the system over time, well, these are the sorts of things that I would remind you of. They suit my style, not necessarily all styles, but I still feel that it's worthy advice to give and it is beginner, rubber hitting the road sort of thinking, which I think we need a little bit more of when it comes to Star Trek Adventures. This video is inspired by my viewing of Star Trek First Response, which is a campaign being followed in actual play over on RuneSlinger's channel. It takes place in the original series era. It's focused on a firefighter, ambulance sort of Saladin class destroyer. It's a little bit of a different tech than other campaigns and other actual plays, especially when it comes to really getting down in the dirt with the nuts and bolts of the system. What really makes this game switch on a television feeling as you play it? Why it feels like Star Trek. And some of that involves some honest learning of the mechanics, not concealing them from you, the viewer. I think actual plays are at their best when they help you learn a system rather than simply entertain you as a passive viewer. Number one is, sometimes the system isn't talking to you right now. If you play other role-playing games, I'm assuming you have, you might have noticed that sometimes, after one of your companions throws the dice for a particularly difficult roll, the table lights up and there's lots of avid talking and description from other players as everyone responds to a telling hit, to a saving throw that's failed or succeeded. Sometimes some particular players at the table have a way of describing these things and talking, even though it was the other character's action. And that can be very welcome and fun. I will put it to you, though, in that in the world of online role-playing, where it's very difficult for us to direct our faces, our gaze, and know that this is between me and you, rather than me and everybody, there's some things about Star Trek Adventures to keep in mind. First is that, as the Game Master says, I think that sounds like it will be a task. A particular player was narrating their character's actions, and there was an intent that was arrived upon that would be difficult enough to be a task. Well, now it's down for the player to begin describing their approach, which forms the attribute and discipline combination. It's time for the player to decide how many opportunities they want to create, perhaps even to narrate what their character is doing, interacting with the pools. You don't need to ask permission to use momentum or to add to threat. It's part of how your character is approaching the world. It's part of you as a player shaping what's happening in the television fiction, whether you draw upon those pools. You don't need to talk to everybody, and everybody doesn't necessarily need to talk to you or suggest. It's part of role-playing your character. In any case, it's taking up time to have those conversations between anyone besides yourself, and a fair amount of session time can get lost in consultation about what to do with the pools, when this could be a feeling of in-character or perhaps authorial role for you as the player, it becomes sort of a design by committee moment. And in the world of online video conferencing software, it's hard for more than one person to talk. It's hard for anything like side conversations or quiet peanut gallery remarks to sneak in while things need to get done. The Game Master's attention just can't focus on a particular place, and there's no way to direct my video is going out to every player, rather than just to one player, with my mouth and my hands and my body language. So that's something to keep in mind, and it carries through until after the task is successful. And that's the moment where the Game Master narrates basic success, and then the particular player and character whose task it was gets to spend momentum and modulate that success. And it's only after all that has taken place that the fiction has really resumed. It's your moment and your character's task. 
and you write part of what happens after you're successful. You decide for yourself if you are going to accept success at cost. And all of those things can get kind of talked over in that excited moment where normally in other role-playing games, the system is just telling you whether you hit or not, whether you climb the wall or not. Star Trek Adventures is a little bit different in that way. Sometimes the system is not talking to you. Now, for something a little bit more fun and interesting that's right there on your character sheet, let's talk about talents. Some people like to talk about feats and other character options as a love letter to the game master about what to include in the campaign. There's nothing wrong with looking at talents in that light, especially if you're the game master. You can take a look at what your players have chosen as options and try and work relevant situations into the narrative sometimes. After all, these are Starfleet officers who probably will be assigned to things which relate to things that they're specialized in, that they have a knack for, that they're talented in. However, one thing to keep in mind is that talents are a love letter to yourself as a player, because many of them switch on based on how you approach things. They color the way that you go into a task. For example, cautious. What does it do? When you purchase additional dice with momentum, you get to re-roll one of the dice afterwards. In other words, when you create an opportunity by leaning on the positive situation, the morale, the assistance, the verb, the team effort, which is taking place in the scene, you're able to pull out success out of situations where you might not have succeeded. You know, like you can do it with fewer dice. You can graze by because you're able to be cautious and, and see that failure down the road. You created an opportunity. You used additional auxiliary power. You delegated some of the targeting responsibilities on that Forton torpedo salvo to one of the folks down in the weapons bay. Well, it might not have gone perfectly well, but you can intervene. Your character is cautious, and you're able to pick up one of those dice and re-roll it. You're able to avoid complications. One of those dice rolled a 20. No, no, no. We will re-roll that and avoid that. That's what cautious does once it's activated. Your character, however, needs to find that momentum in order to activate it. That may mean that you assist other characters to make sure the momentum pool builds. It may mean that you wait for your moment to act until the momentum pool has built up. It may mean that you often use momentum simply to be sure of that reroll. I mean, it could be easy difficulty one or even zero tasks, and you're keeping it in mind that you can avoid complications. And after all, you'll probably earn that point of momentum back on the flip side, if it's an additional excess die that was bought just one for one. Those are the sorts of things that Cautious prompts you to do. It's causing your character to behave in the world and in scenes in a cautious way, which is outside of just the moment that the Game Master tells you to roll the dice. In this way, talents are a little bit different than feats, which sort of switch on at the last minute. The Game Master says, well, there you go, you can do it. Go ahead and do it. And they also, they're not quite as gimmicky as something like Spring Attack, where, well, you're the only person in the world who can go bang and boom in a single move. Instead, they're saying that when you do things this particular way, you have an additional boon that you can take advantage of. So do these things in this particular way, which we happen to see some Star Trek protagonists do. If you don't want to do things that way, pick a different talent. Number three, there are player pacing tools in this game. There are ways for you as the players and the characters to advance the plot of the episode, to discover and unravel the secrets, to escalate and de-escalate a Star Trek episode through its acts. One of the ways that this can happen is through creating advantages. You can make it so that even though it's not happening right now, you can have a plan for when it does happen. So it shall be written, so it shall be done. 
In this way, you can tee things up for an anticipated moment and be confident that your subordinates, the people below decks, uh, the situation will hopefully happen once that trigger moment occurs in a way that you've foreseen. It doesn't mean that it's not hard to set things up. Creating those advantages could be pretty difficult. But you have that kind of control over the future using create advantage. Maybe you just want to be woken up if there's any signs of Romulan activity. You're going to your quarters for the evening. That's what it can do. And this allows you to have some confidence about letting the scene end, letting things move forward and the plot progress. You have made your mark upon things as a protagonist, as a player, as a character. Now it's time to see things out. The next player pacing tool is Make It So, which is an instantaneous way through your values to spend a point of determination and with it to create an advantage. If you're married to the Enterprise and your name is Jim Kirk, then you absolutely probably know that there is a hiding spot on deck six next to one of the photon restabilizer emitters where the Klingon tricorders are not likely to detect the contraband that you are smuggling through the border. You didn't need to think of that or any of the real particulars of it as a player nor did you need to search the whole ship necessarily. It was your values inspiring that in the moment to conjure it almost out of air, to create a trait that can make something possible that wouldn't otherwise. And it can be narrated in this way as the player. Say you don't know about photon emitters. Maybe you don't want to do a bunch of Trekno babble. You can say, as a captain, I know my ship as other men know their wives. I think that there is a place where we can help the ship, where we can sense it's... And with that, you spend the point of determination, perhaps slipping a poker chip in the Game Master direction, and the Game Master says, well, yes, I think there is a place on deck six, and so it shall be written, so it shall be done. Without even a task, this can be the sort of thing that your values can enable. That's what the system is giving you, and it gives you back the feeling of playing a Star Trek episode. I love it for that reason. Now, thirdly, this is down into the weeds of the starship mechanics, but I think it is a frequently overlooked area, and it's a resource which I don't see used very often, which is ship power. And by that I mean every single scene that your characters are aboard the ship you can use some of those points of ship power, not just in combat, but any time that you are attempting an action with the ship, you can divert some auxiliary power to try and boost the success of an action. It creates bonus momentum when you spend power, so it doesn't make it any easier to do something, but once it's done, you get more out of it. Bonus, momentum, that's capital B and capital M, it's a very particular meaning in the rules means you need to spend it now, not later, after the task is complete. So if you do a thorough scan with the main deflector dish of an asteroid which you believe may be hiding an Orion pirate base, you can then use the additional momentum from pouring power into it to create a cordon, to create an alarm that will alert you if anyone later tries to muck about on that asteroid to momentum for an advantage. You can ask additional questions. When were the pirates last here? Have they stashed any of their ill-gotten gains? These are obtain information spends, which you can do right there in the moment using that bonus momentum. All sorts of other ways to use it, but suffice it to say that ship power can literally turn water into wine. It has its risks, of course, increases complication range, but it's always there, and in episodes where you're not likely to get into ship-to-ship -ship combat, we know on the television shows the characters have used it. Perhaps you and your character can use that ship power too. And finally, one thing to keep in mind that's at your prerogative as a player is that your stress comes back when a scene is over. If you are taking damage but you haven't been injured, it's, it's good. 
You're, you come back at the beginning of the next scene, you've got full stress. The ship shields. When one scene elapses, say you're loitering over a planet, conducting a long-term survey. Well, after this scene is over, if a few asteroids hit you, well, when the next scene rolls in, when the next interesting thing happens, the ship is at full shields. Likewise, ship power. One scene ends, another begins, the ship is again at full power. So, if you think that the horizon of danger is not so near that it's going to take place in this scene, then those resources are there to be used. That includes taking risks with your character when it comes to stress. You can walk through a blazing fire with some confidence, so long as you don't take five stress at once and need to avoid injury, and if you need to do that and take eight points of stress over a couple rounds, it's no skin off your back. It's just the sort of heroic thing that the characters do in Star Trek, even early on in an episode. Holding back, based on the idea that these are scarce resources, is one of the reasons that I see Star Trek stories unfold maybe not as quickly as they could and more alike to television pacing as they're able to in Star Trek Adventures. Number four, the rest of the crew is there too. And by that I mean the player characters are not the entirety of your starship, nor are the player characters plus supporting cast characters that you activate. Literally everybody. There are hosts of folks below decks working in science labs, analyzing sensor reports, and doing security patrols throughout your ship, keeping the systems in working order, and even repairing them when they're damaged. There are NPCs that you can call on to get things done, even if you're not hovering over their shoulder. This is Starfleet, and it's a, you know, it, it's a working and well-oiled machine most of the time. It's not a farce, and all those NPC crew are there, and they do get things done. They have their own idea of how to get these things done. They may have beliefs that you don't share, and they may generate some threat sometimes uh, doing things in ways that you might not agree with. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It has its advantages, because there's story to be had besides outside of the ship. Sometimes it's your own crew that is birthing, uh, an entire Star Trek narrative. Oh, and another thing about combat. Injuries, you know, don't sweat the small stuff. First of all, they can be avoided. Secondly, non-lethal injuries, it just means that you wake up in sick bay or you say, whoa, you, we lost you for a little while, you came around, and that's okay. You know, the other player characters wake you up at the beginning of the next scene if you don't want to add to the threat pool by avoiding injury. Uh, there's lots of ways to regain stress, to regain your ability to avoid injury uh, with recovery. So, and you can get from 12 stress and you may knock down to maybe only two stress remaining on your character sheet. And it doesn't mean that it's all over. You can recoup that stress, recoup the ability to avoid injury, even from zero stress. And after this scene, after this peril is over, you'll enter the next scene with full stress again. You might have complications and traits on your character which represent some of the scratches, bruises, cuts, literal missing hands which uh, you might have endured, but you do have all of your HP back, which I think is something that we haven't really fully acknowledged and incorporated into our thinking about the way we play Star Trek Adventures. The scene economy, the pacing of episodes, so much of what's happening aboard ship and how Starfleet does things is there at your beck and call as a player of a Star Trek Adventures campaign. These are the sorts of things that I'd like you to keep in mind as a player in a Star Trek Adventures game. I'd like to get back to having some more Star Trek Adventures content here on the channel. I'm thinking of starting a new campaign myself. I say that even as I've retired largely from social media and taken myself out of the loop of Facebook. Here's a list of all the different postings, all the different attempts to get people interested in various Star Trek games, which I've put up over the years, usually to very little interest. 
So instead of some of those previously less than successful efforts, I'd like to ask you, the audience, if there's a Star Trek Adventures game in your future. I enjoy your company here on YouTube. This is a kind of social media that you can count on me to be here for. Without further ado, Happy New Year, folks. Engage.